This video is sponsored by Brilliant. In 2013, an outbreak of a deadly pathogen ravaged West Africa. The pathogen in question, the Ebola virus, one of the most dangerous pathogens to ever exist. Ebola virus is classified as a biosafety level 4 risk, the highest an entity can be ranked, meaning that there are only 51 labs in the entire world with safety precautions extensive enough to study this virus. To put things in perspective, Yersinia pestis, the pathogen causing the Black Death, the ideological agent responsible for 6 of the 20 deadliest plagues in history is only ranked at a biosafety level of 3. The pathogens that I have chosen to cover so far have been heavily invested in stealthy evasion of the immune system. The most stunning of these immune evaders so far has been rabies, whose chosen cell type to infect is already immune privileged. In an effort to remain undetected by the immune system, the rabies virus actually prevents neurons from dying due to programmed cell death or apoptosis. Ebola, in stark contrast, is not a delicate virus. It has not evolved to care about not destroying its human host. While Ebola infection starts off as immunoevasive, once Ebola begins its rampage throughout the body, the results can only be described as violent. Ebola is a highly transmissible, deadly hemorrhagic fever causing virus with an untreated survival rate hovering around 50%. Up until several years ago, there was no cure or treatment for this virus, with medical teams focusing on playing whack-a-mole with the patient's symptoms, with supportive care, until ultimately the patient naturally clears out the infection or is eventually overcome. Death usually comes in the form of a combination of blood loss due to internal and external bleeding and organ failure. Why is our immune system so helpless in its wake? We're going to answer that in this video, as well as take a look at the incredible work scientists have done to even the scales in the fight against this molecular menace. Ebola is a filamentous negative sense single-stranded RNA virus coding for just 10 different base proteins. Its problematic interaction with our immune system starts right at the moment of infection. While Ebola virus can and will infect almost any cell type in the human host, its preferred hosts early on are dendritic cells and macrophages, both cells of the immune system. You can already imagine that a pathogen that infects the very cells of the body evolved to destroy it is going to be difficult to clear. As a result, the second that Ebola is replicating in the body, both the adaptive and the innate immune systems are already under intense fire. To attack macrophages and dendritic cells, Ebola sneaks in with the trash. At one micron in size, the Ebola virus is a bit too big for certain endocytic pathways to gain entry into the cell. So the Ebola virus has evolved to cover itself in phosphatidylserine it gained from a previous host. Phosphatidylserine, or PS, is a modified lipid, or fatty molecule, that is usually on the inside of a cell. When PS is detected by macrophages, it induces the macrophage to start a process called macropenocytosis, a technique macrophages use to sample their environment and internalize larger sized debris by ruffling their membranes. This is in contrast with phagocytosis, the more well-known pathway phagocytes use to internalize pathogens by chomping down on them. PS is a lipid that is usually on the inside of a cell, but a cell that is going under apoptosis or programmed cell death will recruit proteins to flip the PS to the outside to signal to the macrophage that this cell is about to die. Cells undergoing apoptosis signal to the immune system with this eat me signal to ensure that macrophages are able to clean up the cellular corpses in a timely manner. The mechanism by which the Ebola virus has evolved to decorate its own viral capsid is still being figured out, but it may involve co-opting the host's XKR8 protein, whose job it is to flip the phosphatidylserine onto the cell surface. In doing so, Ebola virus truly sneaks in with the trash, cosplaying as a dying cell to sneak into macrophages undetected. Now the astute biology enjoyer might be wondering, why did the Ebola virus evolve to hijack macropenocytosis as a pathway instead of the more well-known phagocytosis pathway? The difference between these two pathways is that phagocytosis relies on the recognition of certain receptors, while macropenocytosis is less specific. Both of these pathways should lead to the digestion of foreign material by merging with the lysosome, but phagocytosis is more for the purpose of destroying pathogens, while macropenocytosis is more for sampling the environment and displaying antigens for the adaptive immune system. My hypothesis here is that maybe because macropenocytosis was not evolved to specifically destroy pathogens, that it might have been easier for a pathogen to evolve a mechanism to exploit that instead of the potentially more dangerous phagocytosis. But that's purely speculation. I couldn't find a more satisfying answer. Believe me, I had tried.
Once Ebola is taken up by macrophages and dendritic cells, Ebola silences their interferon response. Interferons are a broad class of immune signaling molecules that start programs of antipathogenic defense. The interferon signaling pathway is responsible for a wide range of host responses evolved to deny viruses the ability to replicate, including shutting down protein synthesis to stop viral capsids from being made, upregulation of RNAs L to chop up viral RNA, inducing apoptosis to deny the virus an environment to replicate in, and upregulating proteins that display viral proteins in infected cells to killer T cells to trigger apoptosis. Ebola hinders the interferon pathway by preventing the interferon signal from ever reaching the nucleus. Ebola structural protein VP24 interferes with STAT1, a key immune transcription factor that needs to bind DNA from binding nuclear important. If STAT1 never binds to important, STAT1 will be stuck on the outside of the nucleus, unable to turn on the genetic programs needed to fight off infection. Ebola protein VP35's day job is to form part of the nucleoribosome complex that enables Ebola to make copies of its own genetic material. But by night, this protein is shutting down immunity in all sorts of crazy ways. Here are just two. Tricking the cell into shutting down the interferon transcription factor IRF7. VP35 brings E3 sumo protein ligase together with IRF7. This causes E3 sumo ligase to put a sumo tag on IRF7, rendering it non-functional. Another neat trick the host has to shut down viruses is slicing up viral RNA using the risk complex. See, with some notable exceptions, double-stranded RNA is basically not supposed to exist in a eukaryotic host. Because double-stranded RNA is indicative of an RNA virus replicating their genome. So the host evolved a protein, Dicer, to load double-stranded RNA into the risk complex, which turns it into a weapon that recognizes and destroys that strand of viral RNA. But VP35 manages to screw with the components of the risk complex, preventing it from destroying Ebola genetic material. All of these mechanisms combined means that Ebola is fully capable of infecting macrophages and rendering them silent. They can't mount an interferon response nor can they respond to interferon signals, so they can't effectively fight the infection. The infection is underway and the immune system is none the wiser. As cells eventually succumb to Ebola infection, unable to call for help, unable to even sacrifice their own lives to deny the virus the ability to replicate, cells are capable of one last play. Tetherin. Tetherin is a protein whose function is to keep budding viruses from leaving the cell. Tetherin is a potent inhibitor of viral infection by greatly slowing down the ability of a virus to spread from cell to cell, heroically holding back a rising tide of deadly virus. But of course, Ebola evolved a mechanism to subvert this defense as well. I couldn't find exactly how Ebola manages to do so, maybe it's an indication that there's still a lot of research that can be done. I try my best to steep these stories in as much relevant research as I can, and while it is a bummer that I don't know more about how Ebola shuts down tetherin, I hope knowing that there might be some more important gaps in the research inspires some of you out there to eventually take on this fight. If watching these videos have made you want to do some biology of your own, whether it be through medicine, healthcare, or research, let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear your stories. While Ebola heavily invests in silencing the immune system early on in infection, dying macrophages and dendritic cells will release pro-inflammatory cytokines like tumor necrosis factor, activating inflammatory pathways. TNF-alpha triggers apoptosis, which can also result in the release of macrophaging activating compounds that can further propagate the inflammatory response. The immune system now finds itself in a state of utter chaos, one riddled with contradiction. On one hand, signals from the immune system appear to show that things are fine. The interferon response is low. The dendritic cells haven't activated the T and B cells because they're dying. And NK cells are nowhere to be found. On the other hand, signals from dying dendritic cells and macrophages are saying things are definitely not fine. Pumping out pro-inflammatory signals but not triggering effective mechanisms to fight back prevents the inflammatory response from ever dying down. Instead, inflammation accelerates, potentially resulting in a dangerous condition known as a cytokine storm. This runaway inflammatory response dramatically ramps up the fight response, but unchecked cells get overly stressed and die. Widespread death of cells can then lead to tissue trauma, which can also lead to blood vessels being damaged, causing internal bleeding. As the firestorm of inflammation rages, and as the Ebola virus runs rampant, non-immune cells are hit across the body, resulting in multi-system organ failure, and if left unchecked, death. With macrophages and dendritic cells dying, the Ebola infection can no longer be ignored. 
the role of neutrophils during an Ebola infection is still being worked out, but what is known is that neutrophils may be contributing to the chaos adding to the inflammation. While NK cells and T cells are some of the only cells that Ebola doesn't infect, the sea of fire surrounding them prompts them to die en masse by triggering apoptosis. With so many members of the immune system down and out, who is even left to save the body? The last line of defense, the only cell type to remain relatively untouched by Ebola's rampage, is the B cell, the cell responsible for the creation of antibodies and long-term immunity. Antibodies are potent inhibitors of pathogenic infection, and it would be reasonable to pin our hopes on an antibody-mediated comeback. But once again, Ebola has an answer to that too. In fact, Ebola's response is so unique it was the first strategy of its kind to be discovered. Ebola engages in a tactic called antigenic subversion. The Ebola structural glycoprotein would be a fantastic epitope for the immune system to target. B cells could crank out the antibody against the structural glycoprotein, caging off Ebola viral particles before they get the chance to sneak into cells. This cage of antibodies allows cells of the immune system to safely identify, ingest, and destroy the virus before it gets the chance to pull off any of its tricks. However, Ebola codes for a decoy of the structural glycoprotein, called soluble structural glycoprotein. Since this nomenclature is quite annoying, I'll refer to the structural glycoprotein as structural protein and the soluble structural glycoprotein as annoying fake protein. During infection, the virus forces the host to make a ton of the annoying fake protein. This wave of annoying fake protein overwhelms what is left of the adaptive immune system, and the B cells get tricked into making the wrong antibody. Instead of targeting Ebola's protein armor, the structural protein, to destroy the underlying genetic material, the B cells are busy making antibodies against whatever the heck this is. Antigenic subversion differs from employing antigen decoys, a strategy the RSV virus uses to protect itself from being bound to antibodies. An antigen decoy simply binds to an antibody, rendering it unable to bind the relevant epitope. Antigenic subversion trains the immune system incorrectly. It's an especially devious method of immune evasion and has an immediate and obvious impact on vaccine design. Speaking of vaccines... It's taken years, but yes, we do have vaccines for Ebola. Vaccines work by training the immune system to recognize the presence of certain pathogens. If B cells can learn what the Ebola virus looks like before Ebola can start rolling, the body has a good chance of cleaning up the infection without any drama. Several vaccines have been made and approved since the deadly Ebola outbreak of 2013. Most of these vaccines deliver through one mechanism or another, a copy of the Ebola structural glycoprotein. Without the distraction of the soluble glycoprotein, the immune system is able to train on the correct protein, making handling an Ebola infection much easier for the immune system. Not only were there advancements in Ebola vaccination technology, bona fide treatments for Ebola have been made. Inmazev is a cocktail of three antibodies designed to target you guessed it, the Ebola structural glycoprotein. These three antibodies bind to the glycan cap, the receptor binding site, and the fusion loop. They block off the Ebola virus from being able to infect cells and alert the immune system to a pathogen in need of elimination. A cocktail of three antibodies is also a theoretically great way to prevent Ebola from developing resistance to this treatment. The chance that a strain of Ebola could out-evolve three antibodies at the same time is quite unlikely. Not zero, but unlikely. Developing antibodies against a specific location on a molecular target is a pretty daunting task, but AI technology shows great promise in designing the antibody of tomorrow. If you want to learn more about how AI functions, why not stick around for a bit and listen to me gush about Brilliant, and make sure to stay afterwards for an important channel announcement. Brilliant is where you learn by doing, with thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and AI. Not only is Brilliant's mobile app easy to use and convenient, it also comes stacked with interesting problems and explanations that are sure to actively engage your thinking brain. As I mentioned before, I'm really excited for Brilliant's course in AI. Open the hood of ChatGPT and tinker with large language models. And when you're done with that course, move on to neural networks. If you start thinking with AI now, maybe you'll be at the forefront of the next big discovery. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash the neutrophil or scan the QR code on screen or you can click the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription for using my link. Thank you again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video.
While great strides in research have been made when it comes to this bloody and violent pathogen, there is always more research to be done. The current treatment and vaccines available are only efficacious for the Zara strain of Ebola, and of course we must prepare for a future in which the Zara strain of Ebola could mutate to escape our current treatment strategies. On January 11th, starting at 9am EST, I'll be holding a 12-hour marathon stream where I talk about all the science I could find on glioblastoma, an aggressive form of brain cancer. All proceeds go directly to St. Jude's Research Hospital. If you've never tuned into one of my streams before, now's a good time to check them out. I go through real, actual, publicly available data giving you the opportunity to look at the science and come to your own conclusions. It's a lot of fun to see non-biologists engage with real data, without that data being simplified. I really like doing these streams because it gives me the opportunity to share with you the feeling that I have when doing research for my own videos. I hope to see you there. I'd like to take a moment to just thank my members at the end of this video. Your support means the world to me.